Washington viewers, welcome to Veterans Remember, an ongoing documentary created by HCAM TV Studios on Main Street. I'm Hank Alessio, pleased to host this journey into Hopkinton's past. The Veterans Remember format is a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with men and women from Hopkinton who served in the military. You will see and hear about our town's rich heritage from the grassroots experiences of a selected group of Hopkintonians. You will witness their personal stories, how in their small ways they helped shape the nation, and what impact the military had on their lives. Hundreds of Hopkintonians have served in the military. They've contributed valuable time, often with valor. Recorded conversations completed thus far included persons young and old from all branches of the military and who served in just about every corner of the world. Some of the guests have served in combat zones and many others served in peacetime. We hope you will enjoy seeing family members, your neighbors, or Hopkinton residents you have heard of but never met you may be surprised to learn who has worn the military uniform. Every guest before your very eyes offers a footnote of history telling of experiences which are unique from every other guest. Tapings of several conversations have been forwarded to the Library of Congress and to the Army Heritage Foundation. All sessions are online, just a link away on your home computer. Hopefully, as this town's resource continues to develop, the conversations will be accessible in the libraries and in the schools. All that has been recorded clearly is a Hopkinton treasure. If you know any interesting veteran that could be a guest, please contact HCAM or me. Today on this side of the lens with us is Jimmy Marr, a proud Marine who's served as active duty in Vietnam. Welcome, Jim. Nice to see you, Thank Hank. You. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being willing to share your story. Thank you. Uh, you and I represent the majority of Hopkinton these days. We weren't born here. True. I'm a carpetbagger. How, how did you get here and get into the military? Well, I... Uh Graduated from high school in 1966, uh, a couple of towns away in Medfield, and uh, I didn't go to college. And I was uh, working uh, along with some of my friends who we ultimately uh, ended up joining the Marine Corps in 68 uh, before we got drafted. And uh, we wanted to uh, join the Marines. We were all, well, we were out drinking underage one night, and uh, we just made the uh, decision to do that. And we're all sons of World War II veterans, and uh, we thought it was uh, our duty and obligation to uh, serve our country. And uh, lo and behold, we ended up at uh, Paris Island in South Carolina. Were there members of your family that were in the Marines as well? Yeah, my father was, was in World War II. He was in the Pacific in the uh, First Marine Division. He was at uh, Guadalcanal, Cape, Cape Gloucester, which was part of New Guinea. And then uh, the war ended for him at Pella. We got uh, hit there twice in 24 hours. So <laughs> that ended uh, the war for him. I hope a wound, not a death. No, no. He uh, went on to uh, live until 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he was doing his recovery, that's where he met my mother at the uh, Charlestown Navy Yard mm -hmm. uh, after he was uh, recovering from his wounds at uh, Chelsea Naval Hospital right across the Mystic River Bridge. Mm -hmm. And well, you come from a patriotic background. Yeah, I would say so. And did you have fun down at uh, Quantico? I didn't go to Quantico. Oh, I'm I went, sorry. I went to Paris Island. Paris Island. Enlisted. Did I have fun? Um, it's fun looking back on it now. It was uh, an eye-opening experience, uh, <laughs> as I recall. Mm -hmm. And what did, what did you do in those first weeks in BASIC? Um, we did a lot of exercise, and uh, 
I learned uh, not to be such a fussy eater. Um, we went from a uh, platoon of 80, as they called us, a herd. Uh, in nine weeks, we ended up we were, you know, pretty precise military unit, and uh, it was uh, one of the best experiences of my life. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it was a bad experience. It was a very good experience for me as an individual. I think everybody else who I served with down there, you know, we uh, definitely matured mm -hmm. and grew. I went from uh, 115 pounds to 150 in nine weeks and grew a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. A lot of exercise, well-balanced diet, and probably a lot of fear. <laughs> well, that's certainly impressing a lot of people out there. <laughs> and a after basic, was there anything more uh, in line? We uh, all went to uh, Camp Geiger, at, uh, which was a base in uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina for uh, infantry training regiment. And myself and three of the other guys that I joined with, uh, I ended up in motor transport as a mechanic, and one was an air conditioning technician, uh, one was a electrician, uh, one went to, uh, it was an 0100 administrative, mm -hmm. and then he went back to Paris Island for that training after infantry training, mm -hmm. and then uh, I went on to school at uh, Camp Lejeune for motor transport, that was there for 14 weeks, and uh, Graduated from that and subsequently went to 2nd Marine Division at Mainside Camp Lejeune. And uh, I actually volunteered for uh, Vietnam because a friend of mine had uh, got killed when we were in boot camp. And uh, I volunteered and they told me, you'll never, never leave the States. And I said, all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, two weeks later, I got uh, Westpac orders, which was Western Pacific. And I went home November of 68 for 30 days, and then I went to California uh, for jungle training at uh, Oceanside at Camp Pendleton. And uh, I ended up going, flying from California to Hawaii for 15 minutes, and then we went to uh, Okinawa for uh, a lot of shots and processing, and mm -hmm. uh, I spent Christmas there, and my 20th birthday in Okinawa, and then uh, December 26th, I uh, flew to uh, the Republic of Vietnam and ended there December 26th. Wow. Merry Christmas. How, how was it to be uh, away from home for the first Christmas? Um, it was uh, different because, I mean, you know, I'd always been at home for Christmas and, uh, you know, never been, you know, I was halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. It was... Uh, you know, there's a lot of apprehension because uh, we were going to Vietnam. Were, were any of the group of your original seven going to Vietnam as well? Uh, some of them were already there. The guys who ended up in the infantry, uh, they were already in Vietnam. And then uh, two other guys ended up in Vietnam. Uh, I don't remember when they arrived there. It was close to when I arrived. So Medfield had a pretty uh, strong contingent over there. Uh, there yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of guys who served in Vietnam mm -hmm. yeah, from Medfield, mm -hmm. as is probably in Hockington also. Mm -hmm. So where did you go when you got in country, as they say? I uh, flew into the, Da Nang and we went to processing and you could either go to 1st or 3rd <clears throat> Marine Division. I ended up going to 1st Marine Division and I was uh, flown to uh, Chulai, which is about 80, 100 miles south of Da Nang. And I was assigned to my uh, mm -hmm. outfit, the uh, Ninth Engineer Battalion. Well, the the H Camp people uh, found this nice map of Vietnam, and maybe you can show our viewers uh, where you were. Well, I was right here at Chu Lai, which is below Da Nang. That's where I flew in from Okinawa, and then I was here for uh, twelve on eleven months, twenty seven days and I don't know how many hours, but it was less <laughs> it was less than a year, yeah. as I recall from my DD two fourteen. But that's where I was stationed the whole time. Mm -hmm. It was right on the coast. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the mountains were in back of us and uh, it was actually a pretty country mm -hmm. as far as uh, very lush vegetation. And just for context for our viewers, uh, you've sh seen the map of Vietnam often, I'm sure. In the south, we have Saigon and the Mekong Delta, mm -hmm. and in the very north, 
the border with North Vietnam at the DMZ. Yep. So, Absolutely. Very good. Uh, in fact, uh, two of my friends were at Wei, and then they were at Dong Ha and Quang Tri, which are 3rd Marine Division, which is up by the DMZ. Mm -hmm. They were in the infantry. Yeah, a long time ago. Well, th th that time, uh, you uh, entered around 68, and while you were in North Carolina, or South Carolina? South Carolina. South Carolina. We had just finished with Tet over in uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Pretty bloody and messy. What motivated you and your friends to volunteer for Vietnam? Um, <laughs> well, I guess it was just uh, youthful exuberance. <laughs> They're not going to get somebody your age and my age, Hank, to volunteer for something like that now, would they? <laughs> Young men fight wars, old men make them. Ah, very good, very good. Uh, so you're there. What, what sort of a place was Chu Lai? What did you do? How did you apply your learning from basic? Uh, I was originally uh, assigned to headquarters company, <clears throat> which was a big company. And I was there for about two months, and it was just it was just like a regular job. You got up in the morning, had your breakfast, then you went to work in your fixed trucks, jeeps, whatever needed to be repaired. And, Next day, went back and did the same thing. Yeah, it, was, <clears throat> it was actually kind of boring. Uh, and then, uh, then I got assigned to a letter company because the air mechanic had rotated because of the constant rotation of uh, troops over there. And it was a smaller company. Uh, I, th I thought it was a lot more personal as far as, you know, with a closer-knit uh, closer group of uh, men. And uh, I was the only mechanic, so I had uh, 10 dump trucks, two five tons, one of which was a, uh, <clears throat> a minesweep vehicle, because we had to do the minesweep of uh, Route 1 north from July to uh, Tam Key, which is about 30 miles up. We did that every morning. And then we had uh, also the heavy equipment in the same company as us. So we had heavy equipment, bulldozers, cranes, uh, scrapers, mm -hmm. and then we had the uh, motor transport section, which I was the mechanic for. And uh, that, was, that was different because it, along with being a mechanic, I could also get outside the compound and uh, I got to see the, the countryside. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can explain to us some of those trips outside the compound in the evenings? In the evenings? Well, it was, it was eye-opening, I'll tell you. It was like going back a a hundred years in time. I mean, there was no running water. Everything was out of the well. Uh, they heated with by fire. Um, they didn't have any uh, sanitary facilities that we enjoy here in the United States. I mean, there was just one area outside the villages or a couple of areas where people mm -hmm. went to do what they had to do. And uh, it was kind of an eye opener. I mean, uh, it was very dirty as far as. Uh, there was no trash barrels. There was no recycling. Everything was just thrown on the side of the road, and you know, you'd be surprised what you'd see on the side of the road. It was, you know, a pretty eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. What about your patrols and guard duty that I'm sure you had a little bit of? Well, guard duty I didn't have so much because I was the only mechanic, so I I had kind of a a pass on that, which wasn't bad. But then uh, I used to go out on uh, daytime reconnaissance re patrols and then nighttime uh, patrols also. We did that uh, twice a month. And we had an area outside of our battalion area that was uh, two or three miles. Basically, we had the same patrol routes a couple of times a month that we followed. And uh, that was different. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the water buffaloes didn't like us <laughs> out on the rice paddies. They, uh, they didn't like Americans. I guess it must have been our road or something. But they How many of you went out on patrol? Probably around seven or eight men. There was a uh, patrol leader, a uh, radio man, a Navy corpsman, uh, two or three riflemen, uh, one with an M79. Then we had a point man who was in the front of the patrol. 
yeah, maybe 35, 40 feet ahead of us, and then we had a drag man who was behind the main body of the patrol. And uh, we were out for maybe six, six or seven hours, mm -hmm. depending on uh, the action that was going on there. Mm -hmm. And is there any of that that you can report without getting too graphic? Without violating national security? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was one instance we were in a, on a patrol and we were going across this rice paddy or on the dike and uh, we received fire and we just happened to have this uh, new second lieutenant who had just come in a country and uh, he asked to come on the patrol and the uh, company commander said to me, he says, yeah, he says, he can go with you, but strictly in an advisory capacity. So I says, okay, that's fine, lieutenant, you know. And we went out and one of the instances where we, you know, received hostile fire. And so we get down the other side of the uh, the dike, you know, we're just, you know, returning fire, and uh, he comes up to me in the middle of the firefight and says, you know, you didn't follow company proper procedure. He says, yeah, I know. He says, he says, I might have to write you up, he says, when we get back in. I said, yeah, knock yourself out if you get back in, you know. But uh, he was just new in country. He didn't know what was going on. We have to be easy with second lieutenants. They're like uh, <laughs> PFCs, you know. <laughs> Except they have the gold bars on. Yeah. He turned out to be a good guy. Yeah. You know, he just he was a new guy in country. Mm -hmm. Everybody was for a while. <clears throat> well, then as you, you got to the point where you were near coming home, you were the senior guy around. Mm -hmm. Anything change? Mm. Uh, they said there was three phases of an individual over there. When you first went in country, you were very, you know, nervous and apprehensive and always on guard. And then halfway through your tour or midway, you became a little lethargic and, you know, nonchalant about things. And mm -hmm. then at the end of your tour, you, you know, you want to get the freedom bird out of Danang. You want to go back to the world, you know, get out of this place, you know. So you were pretty apprehensive about things. And that, I think it was the week Maybe two weeks before I left, uh, we were out on a daytime patrol and uh, we came across a uh, booby trap. So uh, the point man came back to me and told me that. So I called in on the radio to the reactionary squad and they come out with some men. And they, uh, I think it was a major or a captain come up to me. He said, where's the, where's the booby trap? Said, it's right up there. He says, you want to show me? I said, I got two weeks left in this place, Major. I says, all due respects to you and your rank. I says, but I want to stay away from that thing. And he said, I understand. So he went up to him. So he did it himself? He went up there with some other men. <laughs> I took care of the rear. Took <laughs> well, I'm sure there's plenty of stories that you won't forget. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, when that two weeks expired, you were still in the service. Where did you go from there? I went uh, <clears throat> from, uh, flew out of Da Nang December 17, 69, and went to Okinawa again for, it uh, uh, wasn't really debriefing, but we had some shots and then, you know, naturally the paperwork mm -hmm. that is so prevalent in the military. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we flew back to uh, El Toro, California, and there we're doing more paperwork. And subsequently, they said that uh, I only had a two-year enlistment. They said, well, we don't need any more truck mechanics. You're going to be uh, separated from active duty. And I said, okay, fine. And they said, well, you know, if we offer you E-5 sergeant and another seven-day leave and another R&R, would you consider re, you know, uh, extending for three months back in Vietnam? And they said, think about it. And I said, nah, it's all right. I'll pass. So from there I went uh, back to uh, Medfield and mm -hmm. I got home December 24th, Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. That was but, nice. But you did get promoted when you were in Vietnam, did you not? Yeah, I, I, I had two promotions, Lance Corporal and then Corporal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, but I, I didn't want to stay any longer. That was fine. I, mm -hmm. I was needed back here in sure. the USA. Sure. Well, how, how similar or different was your mechanics work uh, at your motor pool 
from what you were doing back in Medfield? Was it? Uh, well, the uh, the equipment uh, was uh, military, so the U.S. government always goes for the lowest bidder, not the lowest responsible bidder. So <laughs> we had to do a lot of. I called it procurement. I guess it would be termed something else, grand theft, maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I have. I brought this with me. That these are camouflage utilities that we had. And I was in the EM club one night, and uh, this guy in the army came up to me and said, "Geez, he says, I'd really like to get a pair of them." He says, "Do you think you can get me a pair?" I said, "Yeah, I probably can." He says, "Well." Uh, who are you with the, with the Army? He says, I'm with supplies. So I, I says, really? I says, can you get uh, truck tubes? And he says, sure. He says, well, how many do you need? I says, a couple of boxes. I says, we're having a problem getting tire tubes. So he says, how about a pallet? I says, sure. I said, what else do you want? He says, well, he says, could you get me a bottle of Jack Daniels? And I said, I'll get you a half gallon. And he says, could you get me one of those K bars you Marines have. I said, yeah, I can do that too. So for a set of utilities, a bottle of Jack Daniels, and a K bar, I ended up getting a uh, pallet of tubes. So a lot of bargaining power with all that. They're, they're probably still using those tubes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably were. I know our sea rats are from 1942 to 1944. <laughs> uh, so then coming home, uh, with the stop in California, mm -hmm. you didn't have any other duty assignment uh, in the Marine Corps? No, I was in active reserve. I see. Then so, I came back home and I uh, immediately went to work. Uh, I was kind of disorientated because you just go from one side of the world where the people are shooting at you to uh, back to uh, civilian life. and. Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, I worked in a gas station for a while, you know, repairing cars and pumping gas, and and I went. Uh, I went to work for a uh, sand and gravel company. I started uh, driving trucks and running heavy equipment, which I'm still involved in. And uh, I drove uh, for quite a few companies, and then uh, <clears throat> let me see. In 1974, I met my wife. We got married in 1976. Uh, we moved to Hockington in 79, been here ever since. And let me see, raised three sons here. And now I'm just looking at the uh, <clears throat> age of retirement in another couple of years. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you can get into the procurement business. Yeah, I don't know. I imagine the. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, w it wouldn't be very rewarding at my age, Frank. Uh, Hank. <laughs> well, it it strikes me that you've had an experience in the Marine Corps uh, that served your civilian life mm -hmm. very well. Yep. It's, yep. You were working with vehicles after high school. You got good training with vehicles in the service. Mm -hmm. Worked in a motor pool. Did it when you came home. And it's the same kind of story so many times is told with people who are in the military benefiting there for their civilian lives. And you are one more of those. Yeah, yeah all in all, I think it was a, it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. it, uh, yeah, there's you know, certainly some dark sides to it, but mm -hmm. you know, I think all in all, I think it, was, it served me well to join the military. Yeah. It, uh, Any of your three sons in the military? No. I, uh, Two of them wanted to join the Marines, and I uh, said, sure, that's fine. I said, that's a noble cause. I said, but I said, uh, because of the circumstances, I said, well, I said, it's fine. I said, but just got to do one thing. And they said, what's that? I said, well, you got to wait for everybody in the White House and the legislature to send their sons first. I said, then I said, I'll give you my blessings. I said, I just, yeah. I don't want to get into that, Hank. That's yep. too controversial. All right. All right. All right. Well, another thing that strikes me, too, is uh, your father being in the 1st Marine Division and mm -hmm. you being in the 1st Marine Division. Uh, there's a lot of those kinds of stories 
here in Hopkinton, which is an amazing thing, I think. Yeah, John Cahill and his son. Yes, yes. Yeah, because his son John was in, I think he was in Vietnam the same time as me. Well, he was in there during Tet. So, yeah, um, so he was, yeah. He's got some good stories you can share. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. This has been great, and the time goes by so fast. I wish we had more to spend with you to learn about your experiences. Thank you so much for sharing what you have shared. Mm -hmm. And to those uh, viewing the show, I hope they tell more people about the benefits of Veterans Remember. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, Hank. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay. I'm Cheryl Peralt, co-producer of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, an HCAM series honoring poetry, story, and song that takes place on the third Saturday each month before a live audience. Guest features share their art followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Others come to listen and be part of this warm and welcoming studio and to wake up a bit to arts and to life. You're welcome to join us and to tune in or visit our website for our weekly program. Hope you can join us. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B-movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films, black and white or color. Join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear.